Thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Ya Ali Madad. Uh, welcome back, uh, Rashida Saiba. We had a really great session yesterday and we received many more comments after the session uh, throughout the day. And friends are looking forward to today's uh, session on Jamaat Khana. So whenever you're ready, we are eagerly waiting for you. Shukriya, thank you very much. Sab ke huzur mein jo bhi online hai aur jo bhi abhi join kar rahe hai, sab ke huzur mein bahut saya zizana ya Ali Madar kabul ho. Aur mene last, yesterday in our first session, I had started with a prayer. And if you all bear with me, I would also like to start today with a prayer. Yesterday I started with Rabbi Zidni Ilma, the Prophet's prayer about increase in knowledge. And today I would like to start with another Quranic uh, prayer, which is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Rabbana, Admin lana, Nooranna, Waqfir lana, Inna kala kulli shayin kadir, Rabbana, Admin lana, Nooranna, Waqfir lana, Inna kala kulli shayin kadir, Rabbana, Admin lana, Nooranna, Waqfir lana, Inna kala kulli shayin kadir, يا نور مولانا الشاكرين ملك السين هذا الإمام ولا خداوان whatever we discuss today should be on the basis of your Mubarak words and should be well understood by the listeners and well expressed by the speakers آمين يا رب العالمين so first of all I want to uh, apologize to you all because last night when I was preparing this uh, talk I realized that I was far too ambitious and that I would not be able to do justice to the Ismaili centers and the concept and the vision of Malana Hazarima. Um, I want to explain to you that for 16 years I used to do tours, guided tours of the Ismaili Center, and therefore I have so much feedback from the general public that I want to share that with you uh, properly and to explain the concept properly. So I have requested the organizers, uh, Aziz Bhai and Kamaya Sai, if it's to, if it is all right that today I only concentrate on the history and in the next uh, session, I will devote it entirely to the Ismaili centers uh, across the world. And in, for that, I will uh, combine the two sessions on uh, voluntary service into one. So I hope that you all uh, keep that in mind and uh, you are uh, not too upset by the change which I made last minute. But uh, I was really forced to do that because we should look at subjects in some detail. So today we are looking at the story of the Jamaat Khana through the Ismaili history. And um, uh, I would like uh, to, for you to please show the first slide. This is a very important uh, quotation. It is from Maulana Sultan Muhammad Shah's The Memoirs of Aga Khan from page 182. By the way, whenever I refer to the memoirs, I always refer to the British publication, not the American one. I always refer to the Castle and Company Limited uh, print, uh, which is London, uh, because the, uh, the page number would uh, be different. So please bear that in mind. And I want us to uh, read this, uh, these uh, two sentences three sentences uh, from the chapter 8, The Islamic Concept and My Role as Imam. Mulana Sultan talks about uh, uh, our history and he says that in 1848, Muhammad Shah's reign in Iran, this is in Iran, yes, 
1848, Muhammad Shah's reign came to an end, and my grandfather settled peaceably in Bombay, and there established his Darkhana, or headquarters. Not only was this a wise and happy personal decision, but it had an admirable effect on the religious and communal life of the whole Ismaili world. And this is my emphasis. I have uh, made these words bold and I have underlined. I will explain why. It was as if the heavy load of persecution and fanatical hostility which they, the Ismailis, had to bear for so long was lifted. I want you all to read this to yourself. It was as if the heavy, heavy load of persecution and fanatical hostility which they had to bear for so long was lifted. You know, this is the amazing the way the noor of the Imam works, you know, my mind simply cannot, you know, I, I hope I can convey this to you all, that in that one sentence which I have highlighted, Imam is looking at the entire history of the Ismaili Tariqa from the time of the Prophet to this time, 1848. So if we go to the second um, slide. What does this for so long? What is its definition? For that we need to know our history. And I know that is not one of the strengths, unfortunately, of our Jamaat. We do not really know our history well. But inshallah now, we hope that more and more students will do research on our history. Now, it's only a very thumbnail sketch of our history. So 570 AD is the birth of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. In 610, when he was 40 years old, he received the salad of prophethood, he became a prophet. Until then, he was simply known as Muhammad and he had two titles, Al-Amin and As-Sadiq. So when he started spreading his message of Islam, in 12 years' time, he was forced by persecution to emigrate from Mecca to what became known as Medina Tul Nabi. The old name of that town city was Yathri. And Medina Tul Nabi marks the Prophet's settlement there. And now it is shortened to simply as Medina. And then 10 years later, in 632, the Holy Spirit passes from this world at the age of 63. Now, Maulana Sultan Muhammad Shah mentions 1848 as the establishment of Darkhana and the a wonderful effect, positive effect it had on the global Ismaili Jamaat and how it lifted this uh, fanatical hostility and the persecution burden which we had suffered for so long. So what I've done is I've taken from 1848 and removed uh, minus 610, this shows that the Ismaili community has undergone persecution for 12 and a half centuries, 1238 years. So when we talk about Jamaqana, we have to be aware of this issue. We really have to know. And then the next point is that if you count the years from 1848 to now, 2021, it is only 173 years of peace, of freedom from persecution, 
only 172 years. You know, these are really important facts for our Jamaat, particularly our younger generation. But how will the younger generation know these things when their parents are unaware? So this is why I put a thumbnail sketch because we, we would not understand that one sentence of the memoirs without this background. Okay, so now let's go to, um, now uh, I would now like to talk uh, more before I show you the other slide. Uh, we don't need this slide on at the moment, uh, Aziz Bhai, just go back to the previous slide. So now, what, what I want to say is that yesterday we touched on the fact that the Prophet, one of the first things he did in Medina was to build a very simple masjid and his rooms with his uh, wives were around the courtyard. And this masjid had a platform before you entered it. And so the namaz, because it was a time of Sharia, the namaz was recited inside the masjid. Men and women all attended together. The women uh, uh, sat at the back. And then when the, mas uh, the namaz time was over, uh, everybody dispersed to their work. But sometimes a small group of people would sit with the prophet and learn the deeper wisdom of the Holy Quran and talk more about the spirituality of the Quran. And these people were called the Ahl al Sufa, and they were receiving special instruction from the Prophet. You know, there were people like Salman um, al Farsi, Mikdad, who was a Gifari. And these people sometimes also offered the Holy Prophet what in the Holy Quran is called Najwakum Sadaka. And of course, it is wrongly translated as arms. <laughs> and this is in Surah 58, Ayat number 12, if you want to make a note of it. Najwakum Sadaka, which means what we would today in our modern terminology call Mekmani. An offering which God asks you to give if you want to have a private, confidential discourse with the prophet. So there was that as well. And, and the question is, would these private discourses be about worldly matters? Perhaps one or two of them. But more so they were about spirituality and how to progress in spirituality. The esoteric side, which was very, very little, it only involved a few individuals, and you know, if these few individuals used to also accompany the Holy Prophet to Mount Gira to do his ibadat of the night. So this is something which was happening at the same time as the Sharia. There was definitely Hakika and there was definitely Marifa, but it was confined to a very tiny minority. All right. Now, we've seen 632 the Holy Prophet passes from this world. What happens immediately? Immediately, immediately meaning the Prophet is not even buried there. Hazrat Ali is busy in burying the Prophet. What happens? A so-called election is held in Medina and uh, they decide that they do not need any more religious leadership and that they would only have a secular caliph. And so we have a period of turmoil for the Ismailis. So the ones who were the followers of the Imam, Molana Ali, this is a time of great turmoil. But Molana Ali himself decided that for the sake of the unity of the world of Islam, which was so young, he decided that he would not fight for his right. So, what do we have then? That um, um, we have uh, three secular or worldly caliphs. 
and uh, Maulana Ali is regarded by the majority of the Muslims, uh, Sunni Muslims, as the fourth Khalif. But that is not the case with the Shias, all Shias. So for that now, the next one, again it is from the memoirs of Maulana Sultan Muhammad Shah. If you can have the next slide please. Now this title is very important. This is not in the memoirs. This Khalifa Tun Bila Fasal. Khalifa Tun Bila Fasal, which in English means Khalifa without interruption. And this word Khalifa is the way it is written in the Holy Quran in the story of Hazrat Adam that God would appoint a Khalifa in the earth. So this is, this, this is our words from our history. The rest of the quotation is from Mulana Sultan Rashad's memoirs. Ali, the Prophet's cousin and son-in-law, the husband of his beloved and only surviving child, Fatima, his first convert, his bold champion in many a war, whom the Prophet in his lifetime said would be to him as Aaron was to Moses, his brother and right-hand man in the veins of whose descendants the Prophet's own blood would flow, appeared destined to be that true successor, and such had been the general expectation of Islam. The Shias have therefore always held that after the Prophet's death, divine power, guidance, and as the first Imam or spiritual chief of the devout. The Sunnis, however, consider him the fourth in the succession of Caliph. Now look at the spelling of this Caliph. This is the worldly Caliph. The succession of Caliph to temporal power. Again, this is from the British publication of the memoirs. It's on page 178. And of course, anybody who is interested in knowing our history should read the whole of that chapter, but particularly the paragraphs which are preceding this. And, and I, at the same time, I want to point out to you that this book, Malan Sultan Shah mentioned in his speech at the Platinum, Platinum Jubilee Ceremony in Cairo, 1955, he mentioned that he had written this memoirs for the whole world. And you know, there are the translations of this book in German, French, in Norwegian, in Japanese, in Hindi, Gujarati, Urdu, number of languages, because it is for the whole world. But uh, when do you feel sorry? When you realize that the Jamaat do not read this book or particularly this chapter. So this is a very important point for us to keep in mind that um, the early history started very uh, painfully for Ismaili. And then this pain and this persecution and this hostility lasted 1238 years. Now, this pain doesn't stop even after Mawlana Ali becomes the so-called fourth Khalif of uh, Islam, but to us Ismailis, he has been Khalifa, the way it's written on this slide, without interruption, immediately after the Prophet, because the light of Allah cannot be extinguished. The Holy Quran says in two places, if you want to make a note of these ayats, one of them is Surah 9, Ayat 32, and the other one is Surah 66, Ayat 8. Both of these Ayats tell you that 
the light of Allah cannot be ex extinguished, no matter how much the uh, the kafirun, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the enemies of the light, the uh, opposers of the light desire to blow it out, but it cannot be blown out. So if you have these two ayats, in front of I just want to make sure that I have given the second one correctly. Um, yes, no, sorry, I get it, I, I always have a suspicion. So it's 9.32 and 61.8, 61.8, because there is another uh, um, ayat, 66.8, which is also about light, but that's a different uh, subject. These two, almost the same words, they tell you that the light of Allah cannot be blown up. So, for us, Maulana Ali is in that unbroken chain of imamah. An unbroken chain of imamah that goes even beyond. It goes all the way back to Hazrat Adam and beyond because uh, religion is eternal. There is no beginning and there is no end. Therefore, the rule is eternal, no beginning and no end. All right. Now we come to, I want you to now try and uh, take this fact in, which is again extremely uh, difficult. Within 25 years of the Holy Prophet's passing, three members, three members, of the Ahlul Bayt, the Panchtan Park, Mullah Ali, Imam Hassan, and Imam Hussein all are all martyred. They are all martyred. Because this is the attempt to blow out the light of Allah. But as you all know, that at uh, Karbala, every single male was killed except. Maulana Zainil Abedin, who was a young a teenager, 14 years old, and he was saved by Hazrat Zainab, the sister of um, Maulana Hussein, who later went to the court of Yazid and from the Quran gave them proof of how this line cannot ever be destroyed because God Himself guarantees that in the Qur'an. So if three members of the Adal Bayt are martyred within 25 years of the Prophet's passing, I hope you get a, a sense of how difficult it must have been for the followers of the Imam and the Imams themselves. So of course, Maulana Zainil Abidin and all the Imams after him kept a low profile they totally kept a low profile because there was far too much hostility and persecution. And what do we find? We find that Molana, this is another bit of history, and I will give you the reference as well, that Molana Jafar Sadi actually had to carry out a fake burial of Molana Ismail. And he actually called the governor of the Medina to uh, witness this and got a certificate from him to say, yes, uh, Marana Ismail is no more. But this is all fake to foil the enemies, to, to make them, uh, you know, go on a different path. So these are the type of things that our Imams and the Jamaat have had to go through. Of course, Maulana Ismail was there. He was seen in Basra, and the uh, reigning dynasty of the time uh, also came and challenged uh, Maulana Jafar Sadi that your son is alive, and he showed the certificate of the, of the uh, chief of the city. He said, look, uh, I have a certificate. <laughs> this type of things, you know, are in our history. And if you want the reference for this, go to uh, a book called uh, Muslim Sects and Divisions. And it is a book uh, written in original uh, language by the uh, great uh, Abdul Karim 
Shahrastani. Sayyidna Abdul Karim Shahrastani. Uh, it is very interesting because modern research has shown that he was a hidden Ismaili. He was a hidden Ismaili. When I googled his name uh, earlier, they called him an Ash'ari Muslim. But he was a hidden Ismaili and this has been proved by recent scholarship. He wrote a book called Kitab al-Milal wal-Nihal and a section of that book was translated by uh, A.K. Kazi and J.G. Flynn which is called Muslim Sex and Division. And this, what I've just told you about Maulana Jafri Sadiq having to pretend that his son had passed. This is in that book. And you can read it and the rest of it because it is um, Sayyidina Sharistani we have to thank for preserving the doctrine of Ta'neem which Sayyidina Hassan bin Sabah had given and which of course was completely destroyed by the Mongols. So this painful history means that from the Arabian period our Imams moved to Syria and there is a door a Satar in which we have three Imams uh, living in uh, uh, Syria, completely unknown to the public. They are only known to the closest Hujjats and Dais. But amazingly, although it is more a the work of the Dawa flourishes. You know, when we went to Syria in Salamiya, there is a masjid and underneath there is a, uh, the beginning of a tunnel. And that tunnel goes straight out miles and miles away in the desert. This was built during this Dore Sattar if the Imam had to escape at the last moment. So these are the type of things which are existing and more and more, inshallah, will be known about them. So from Syria and the Dore Sattar, there is a positive outcome, which is that Molana Mahdi, appears in North Africa. And this is the beginning of the glorious period of the Fatimids. Because from North Africa, he then goes to uh, you know, Egypt and to uh, other places in the Middle East. And the Fatimid Empire becomes very strong and very well known. And it flourishes in the sciences, in the arts, in the humanities, in architecture. You name it, there is no skill that was missing in this time. And in this time, what do we have? Because it is a time of uh, Sharia. We have Masajid, Allah Azhar. The plural of Masjid is Masajid. Plural of uh, Majlis is Majalis. So in this time, uh, Namaz is recited in the Al Azhar Mosque uh, and uh, in the Khalif. Uh, uh, Al Hakim Mosque and, and other mosques as well. There are more than these two. And at the same time, the, the Hakikat and the Marifat is preserved in the Imam's palace. How do you know this? If you read books like The Fatimid Traditions of Learning by Heinz Palm, this is a publication of the Institute. It is not a huge book. It is a very important book. It should be in the homes of every member of the Jamaat and it should be read. It's a very important book. I would recommend, there are not too many books I would recommend, but this one is one that I would recommend. And in it you will find a full description of how these Majalis were attended by men and women, smiley men and women. They were in a very tiny minority. The Imams were the worldly caliphs as well as the Imam, but the Jamaat was very small. And this is why today in Egypt there are no Ismailis. And in this, in these Machalis, you see, we, because later on we are going to look at our uh, practices. Well, we have one of our practices, Machalis, several different Machalis. How do they, how do we understand them now? only if you understand our history. So, inshallah, we'll come to that in that uh, specific time. But for now, these Majalis 
were conducted by great Ismaili peace hujjats, as they are called. In classical Arabic, they are called hujjats, and one of them whose name shines like a bright star is Sayyidina al Muayyad Fid bin Shirazi. And he used to prepare these lectures, which are called majlis, and the Imam would look at them and then he would deliver them to these uh, evening uh, or nighttime groups of the Jamaat. And there are 800 of those majalis. And so far, only 20 of them have been um, uh, translated into English and printed by the Ismaili edition as it was then of Pakistan. These books are, these majalis, these lectures are about the ta'wil of the Qur'an, the esoteric, the inner meaning of the Qur'an. So, here we are, that we have this uh, period of our uh, history, which is extremely, extremely uh, famous, renowned, uh, well-known for its pluralism, its respect for all faiths, whether they were Jews or Christian Copts, Coptic Christians, uh, Sunnis with their different schools of interpretation, everybody was uh, living peaceably together. And so there was an opposing empire also, the one which had started from Muawiya. Now it is called the Abbasids. And the Abbasids were most worried about this wonderful uh, example of uh, how uh, people should be governed. And they, they commissioned and uh, giving a lot of money to uh, scholars, Sunni scholars. They paid them huge amounts of money to write against our imams. You know, my husband, Fakir Muhammad Hunzai, Dr. Fakir Muhammad Hunzai, often tells me, that uh, in a way he is happy that uh, not too many members of our Jamaat read Arabic. Because if, it, they, if they did, they would have to, they would, might come across this literature which is full of poison, full of vitriol, full of, you know, damning things about our Imam. All fake, all false, fabricated. Now, these are things of our history, and I really don't think too many people know this at all. They need to know that. They need to know that for their own sake, not to challenge others. For their own sake to understand who they are and what is their role in the world today in fulfilling the Imam's vision. So we all know that... Uh, in this period, from Molana Jafar Sadiq, of course, we all know that uh, um, there was a split in Shia Islam, and then at the end of the Fatimid, Fatimid Empire in, in Egypt and surroundings, uh, again there is a split because uh, Molana Nizar's rightful imamat is denied, and then we have the start of the Alamut period, it is better known as the Alamut period, but in a way it is a continuation of the two Fatimids. Because the ones which were left behind were not two Fatimids. I mean, that is our interpretation, certainly. But I'm sure that the Musa Alavian Ismailis will regard this as true as well. Because we all have our own interpretations of history. So in Alamut, now, why would Sayyidina Hassan bin Sabba buy, buy this port uh, uh, called uh, Alamo? Hmm? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about why Ismailis even today live in mountainous areas? Punjab, very mountainous. Tajikistan, the Pamids are very mountainous. Uh, Afghan Badakhshan is mountainous, isolated. Why? Why do Ismailis choose to live in these type of really quite inhospitable circumstances, uh, habitats, environments, as a protection from persecution? So bear that in mind. 
Like, you know, we all talk about Sayyidina Hassan bin Sadba and the Fidais. But do we know why they chose to do that? To escape the persecution of the Saljuk Empire. Right? And in this, this period ends, if you want to know more about this period of history and the Mongol cataclysm that turned everything upside down, you need to read a book called A Smiles in the Middle Ages by Professor Shafiq Birani. It, you may find it difficult in the beginning because it's an academic book, but one should continue and persist because you can get really first-hand information. All that. Right. So we now have the Mongol invasion and the fall of al Now, what happens to our imams? Several have been martyred in the meantime, of course, but what happens to the continuing line of imams? 700 years in Iran. 700 years in Iran. And what do we find? We find in our Ginan literature names like uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Alamut, Gadpat, and Deil Madesh. We find uh, word, uh, names like Kahak, Nagri, Anjudan. Yes. See, the Imams could not settle peaceably in any one center. They had to keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. But you can't have guys writing books moving all the time. All the time they are moving, right? And therefore, these 700 years, with the exception of very few small treatises, booklets, and some poetry of people like Nizari Kuistani and Fidai uh, Khurasani, etc. There is very little literature. But we have to find history somehow. So for instance, if you go to some of these places where the Imams had settled, they uh, go to the uh, Kabristan, the cemetery, and you find Khojki names, names of Indian Ismailis who had visited uh, that area or that town uh, to do the didar of the, the imam of their time. So evidence is there, but not enough research has been done. Much more remains to be done. And so here I want to elaborate on um, something which is very important, that in these 700 years of, you know, what was really precautionary secrecy called Takiya, this uh, meant that our Imams did adopt a lot of Sufi terminology. Sufi terminology. Because, you know, Sufism also had started around uh, Molana Ali's time. Um, uh, really, they were so disappointed by the behavior of people like Moabia and Yazid that instead of coming back to Imamat, they had started their own movement which has become very well known in Islam as Sufism or Tasawo. And so they also had spread throughout the Muslim world. And they were strong in Iran, in Persia. And our Imams did adopt some of their things in order to guard their secrecy. But when you look at the meanings, they are very, very different. There's a great difference, chalk and cheese. So let's take the word peer. The word peer is a Sufi word. And peer has many meanings. For instance, a peer from Persian has come into Urdu, etc. It can mean a very elderly person or a very uh, respected person, peer. But it can also mean the head of a Sufi group, peer. But for us as Maldives, it has a totally different meaning. The word peer in our tariqa means the moon. We have the symbolism of the sun and the moon, Shah and peer. And peer is that Ismaili moment who has elevated himself or herself spiritually to become the reflection of the sun's light. 
like the moon is. And therefore, the fear is somebody whom the Imam appoints. It is not somebody a group of people can appoint. The fear is somebody in a smiley tarika, is somebody who elevates spiritually and then the Imam appoints them to that position. Like fear Sadruddin, fear Nasir Kisra, fear Hassan Kabirya. These are the fears in the meaning of the Ismaili Tarika. And then once the Iranian period comes to a very, very painful end because of the martyrdom of Maulana Khalilullah in Yaz, and Maulana Aga Hassan Ali Shah leaves Iran and he comes to sin and finally to him. And this is where the Indian period comes. And in the Indian period, what you have? You have the tail end of the Mughal Empire in India. And the Mughals were Sunnis. They didn't like the Shias much, including some of their own family who had become Shias. So there was persecution. And to save the Jamaat from this persecution, Dei Sadruddin guided the king to the Imam's uh, command to keep their Hindu names. Not, uh, our young people must be wondering how come, you know, there are many Hoja Ismailis across the world who still have Hindu surname, like Ramji, Keshavji. You know, all these are Hindu names. Why? Why did we have those Hindu names? Again, to preserve our, our security, our peace and our happiness. We had to keep on, keep always a veil, a hijab. Uh, uh, had to keep an outer identity which was different from our inner identity. And it is in the time of this Hadruddin that we have some historical information from his compositions that the first Jamaat Khana was established in Kotri, in Sin. And we have other information from his Dinas and the Dinas of other peers where Mukti Kamariyas are mentioned. Their names are even mentioned. So why did Peer Sadruddin use the word Jamaat Khana? In, uh, in Iran, they were, the Sufis used mostly Kanaka. They still do. But in India, there were Sufi groups that used the word Jamaat Khana. So we can estimate, we can guess, gauge that the Sadhuddin must have chosen this name as preserving our secrecy. So that people would not know our real identity. Because throughout this week, Throughout history, we Ismailis, whether it was a time of Sharia and we were practicing the Sharia very, very carefully, or the time of Hakika, the thing which has annoyed people about us is that we have never left the rope of Allah. We have always held on fast to Abdullah, the rope of Imamah. the unbroken chain of Imam, the continuing chain of Imam. And that is an origin for some reason. Inshallah, I think we are past those ages now. We are in a very different uh, uh, set of circumstances now, Inshallah. And in this set of circumstances, imperialism had a very important part to play. You know, the more, all of us would agree that uh, uh, you know, empires did a lot of damage to the world, but, um, you know, for Ismailis, the empire history of the world has really been quite positive, huh? Uh, let me explain. So, the Ottoman Empire, which was again a uh, Sunni Empire, lasted until 1925 around. And they used to persecute Ismailis of Syria. When we went to Syria, we met a Qasida Khan, very famous man who recites a lot of Qasida beautifully. 
he came to meet us and he told us a story of his grandfather. He said his grandfather had vast uh, tracts of land. He was a great landowner uh, in the near the northern border of Syria, which is adjacent to what is today Turkey. And the Ottomans were in Istanbul and in, uh, in Turkey. And the Ottomans would, would not allow his grandfather to say, Ya Ali Madad. So his grandfather left all his land. He left it. He just abandoned it. And he moved to Salamia and he said, oh, what, what use is this land to me if I cannot say Ya Ali Madad? This type of persecution. And they also told us that there are excavations in that part of the northern Syria, but of course now with the uh, conflict going on there, uh, I don't know whether this continues. When we went in 2007, we were told that they have found graves of Ismailis, and when they looked at the skeletons, they had nails driven into their brains. But what happened? The British and the French empires, they toppled the Ottoman Empire. And then they divided up the Middle East amongst themselves. And Syria came under the French uh, jurisdiction. And as soon as that happened, there was freedom of worship. In the same way, let's look at what happened in India. You know, I think some of our young people have problems with the fact that Molana Aga Hassan Alisha helped the British to quell the northern frontier tribes. You know, because he had an army, very wonderful crack army of, uh, of a troop of cavalry. But why did he do that? For the sake of the Jamaat. Because after that, the British throughout, up to now, have respected the Imam's family. And what did they do, the British Empire? They toppled the Mughals. The Mughal Empire was finished. and. The British also, in spite of whatever they, they did as an empire uh, country, but they allowed freedom of religion. And what about in Tajikistan? The Russian Empire. The Russian Empire freed our Ismaili Jamaat from what are called the Khanates. This was a group of dynasties who used to um, charge extra tax to Ismailis, considering saying, you are non-Muslim. So they were liberated from that oppression, but of course they didn't have freedom of religion because uh, the Russians are well, communists, are still communists, some of them. But the Ismaili Khalifas, they were not Jawaharlals. Even today there are two, one in Dushanbe, one in uh, Koro. But the practices happen in the homes of Khalifas. Khalifas had a special room in their homes where they would do zikr majlis and keep the Jamaat alive in its beliefs through Qasidas and Madol, Khani, etc. And you know, there's a beautiful story about a, a young Tajiki Ismaili who, is a, who has a PhD from Toronto University. His name is Shapkodu. And we heard this story from our friend Professor Shafi Virani. Shapkodu when he applied for his uh, uh, place in uh, Toronto University, he had to give uh, uh, like a personal description. And in this personal description, he said that when he was young, he remembered his grandfather doing zikr. And he, being young, was really worried that, you know, the authorities, the Russian authorities, would uh, catch his uh, grandparents doing zikr and jail them. Or whatever. So one day he said to his grandparents, please, can you stop? Otherwise you are going to be in great trouble. And the grandparents said, we are not worried about worldly troubles. We are worried about our soul. This is the way the Ismailis have had to practice. You know? So let's look at a few more points that from India, the establishment of the Jamaat Khanas there, um, 
from there the Jamaat emigrated uh, on the advice of our Imam Mulana Ghassan Ali Shah, Mulana Ali Shah, Mulana Sultan Muhammad Shah, Salawatullah Alayhi. And uh, they came to East Africa. I believe that the first Jamaat Khana was built in Bagamoyo, which is in Tanzania. And then that beautiful historic Jamaat Khana in Zanzibar, which was built by one moment and then given as a gift to the Jamaat to the Imam. It's a beautiful Jamaat Khana. Unfortunately, there are only a handful of Ismailis in uh, uh, Zanzibar. And then we know that from uh, India, um, this uh, idea, for instance, uh, in the state, the uh, Hunza was an Ismaili state. The ruler was an Ismaili. So there it was quite easy in the sense that Molana Aga Abdul Samad, who used to work for the British uh, Secret Service, he was a cousin of Molana Sultan Shah. When he used to pass through Hunza on his way to China, he encouraged the Jamaat there to build Jamaat Khana. And when Peer Sabdali made his Central Asian tour, he of course affirmed and confirmed. And so every village, every town in Hunza has at least one, two or three Jamaat Khana. And then in China, because Allama Nasiruddin Nasir Hunzai is a Hunzai, and he went to China to serve the Jamaat in 1949. In 1949, he built, with the help of a, 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 a very devoted Ismaili, uh, Aziz Muhammad Khan Sahib, he built the first Jamaat Khana in China uh, in a town called Karangu Tugra. And it is still existing, that Jamaat Khana. And in, um, in uh, Syria, you will find that uh, because it's an Arabic uh, speaking Jamaat, that they actually call the Jamaat Khana Masjid. In Damascus, the Ismaili uh, center is called Markaz, the main center. And in Iran, they are called Hanakas. So there is amazing diversity, amazing diversity, but everywhere the Jamaat Khana in one form or another exists in the Ismaili world. You know, Hazel Imam always mentions that diversity is a strength. If we go to the next uh, uh, slide, which is my last slide, I want to explain also what does Jamaat Khana mean? Our definition, right? Because to a Sufi, it means something different. To us, it means something very different. So first of all, it's a compound Persian word, Jamaat and Khanda. What is a Jamaat? Uh, how do you become a Jamaat? It is a group of people, it's not a single person. It's a group with a particular identity. In our case, what is that? Uh, the foundation of that identity that we have performed Bahia to the Imam of the time. And I have quoted the paragraph B from the preamble of the Ismaili constitution, the authority of the Imam in the Ismaili Tarika is testified by Bayya, by the Murid to the Imam, which is the act of acceptance by the Murid of the permanent spiritual bond between the Imam and the Murid. Permanent spiritual bond. You know, I'm thinking of the young lady who asked about the uh, reincarnation in yesterday's session, please read this and memorize it, because you will see how we are permanently spiritually bound to the Imam. And Kana is just a place, but a place in our case which is designated and sanctioned by the Imam of the time as a place where we congregate in order to pray and in order to do many other institutional things. And a good example from our practices is the Tasbi. Take our Tasbi. All the beads are held together by a thread. If the thread were to be taken out, all the beads would scatter. So here we have the Quranic ayah, Surah 3, Ayah 1 or 3, hold fast all of you together to the rope of Allah, and do not be divided. This is about 
holding on to the line of Imam. And, and look at the Quranic words, look at what God says, that it is up to you, human beings, to find, recognize, and hold to that rope. If, if the God does not tell the rope, you have to go and hold the people fast. The onus is on us, because we have the intellect with which we judge things. So, this is our definition of Jamakana. I have given you a very, very abbreviated history. I have explained to you the diversity of names and the diversity which is in the Ismaili Jamal, because it's a dynamic Jamal. And this diversity is a great strength because it is around the unity of the concept of a continuing imamat, which is our greatest blessing. Greatest blessing, alhamdulillah. I think I would like to stop there now, and if there are questions, you can uh, look at it. But before you ask questions, I do have suggestions. Uh, because, you know, my... Uh, I am a very humble teacher, and as a teacher, I believe that it is not enough to listen. You also have to read and study. So I would like to give today, all of you, the website www.monoreality.org, on which you will find an article by Dr. Fakir Muhammad Hunzai called a living branch of Islam, a living branch of Islam, the Ismailis of Hunza, and it is uh, uh, 5,000 words long only. It was published in a, a, in a journal in Italy. And in this article, you will again get a reinforcement of our history and about our practices. But it's a very short article, 5,000 words only. Please read it, it's in English. And in it, I want to particularly point you to where we are discussing our Tarika practices. Yesterday I forgot to mention that we owe a great debt, debt to Sayyidina Nasiruddin Tusi and Sayyidina Sultan Mahmud who have written the book, a Paradise of, uh, Submission of what? Submission to Paradise, or Paradise of Submission. Paradise of Submission, the original name being the Saura. In it, Sayyidina Tusi explains that in the time of Sharia, time is divided up, and you remember God so many times, five times or that. But in the time of Hakika, in the time of Kiyama, in the time of Ta'wil, the entire time is immersed in Ibadah. That's why the Sadruddin converted the Surah 3, Ayat 191, into these beautiful words. Which is what Hazi Imam keeps telling us. Whenever you have a moment, remember Allah, Muhammad, Ali, to say the names of all the Imams, the name of the Imam of the time. Because the name of the Imam of the time is the supreme name of God. And while you are on Mono Reality website, please, uh, I'm not selling my own article, but I think it's very important that when you study history, I have a farman here, uh, which Molana Hassan Imam had made in 1960 to the rising students of the Pakistan Ismailia Association. And in this uh, Farman, Maulana Hazar Imam says, the most important problem by far for us today is to create students who are capable of going back and of reading the original texts of our history, of reading these texts in Arabic, of reading them in Persian, of reading them in Urdu, of reading them in Gujarati, of reading them in any language in which they have been written. More than ever today, we must be able to publish authoritative documents based on 
primary sources. There is no point in us rereading and rereading and rereading third hand or fourth hand documents. And in this article which uh, this humble entity has written on Hazrat Khadija, so that is also on the Mono Reality website, you will realize that there is a world of difference between third and fourth and uh, text and what the primary source says about Hazrat Khadija. It is not a long article. Please read it. I appeal all the men and the women on this line, please read that article. Particularly because I believe that recently in America, uh, the Jamaati publication had an article, but that article on other Khadija was not written from primary sources. So you will have something to compare with. I urge you to read some things as well in order to, to progress your soul, to elevate your soul. Knowledge is so important, Molana. You know, I sent uh, uh, yesterday, I did another slide to my previous um, talk about the importance of study, nature, the importance of, here is his Farman, 1960, three years after he became Imam, he's telling us, don't reread and reread and reread third hand and fourth hand, because you are only going to get mixed up in other people's interpretations. Our interpretations are very different. So read them and understand them. And if you have read these articles and in the future sessions you have questions, I will be more than willing to answer. Thank you all and bless you all for your attention. Subhanallah. It's not a book. It's, it's not a book. Somebody has just posted a point saying, Living branch of Islam. It's not a book, it's an article and it will be in the file of Dr. Fakir Muhammad Onzari and the article on Hazrat Khadija will be in the Rashid Anurma Onzari file. Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. I, I don't think we can just listen this one time and comprehend and digest all the things that you have told us, uh, especially the history of Ismailis, did it all the way back to Mola Ali. Uh, it probably would take few listenings and looking at these slides a few more times to comprehend everything. Uh, thank you so much for uh, hard work in bringing this talk together for us. Thank you so much. There are few questions, uh, if you don't mind, if you still have some time. There's one question from actually yesterday, so I, I will start with that one. During the Golden Jubilee time, Maulana Hazri Imam Salvatullah had given or have given a forman about the uniform text of Salat for Ismaili. What was that and what happened to it?
And then he was sent in Maulana Hazrat Imam Suzu. And when it went to Maulana Hazrat Imam Suzu and then it came back again, Dr. Sahib saw a very important change. But I bet you, none of you will be aware of this. What is this change? That in our Nika, towards the end, there is a recitation of the names of couples, Adam and Hawa, um, uh, Yusuf and Zuleika, Nabi Muhammad and Khadija, etc. Right? One of those pairs in the, all the old scripts was uh, Ibrahim and Sarah. Hazir Imam changed the name Sarah to Hajira. Do you all of you know that Hajira is the name of Molana Ismail's mother, the one who had to be abandoned by the Prophet uh, in uh, Makkah, near Makkah, with her child, baby child. Hajira is the one who ran between Safa and Marwa looking for water. Because our Imam's line comes from there. That's why he made that change. But I don't think the Jamaat knows about it. So whatever the Imam sends us, I beg you, let's look at it carefully. And let's look at what it means for us. That's my appeal. Uh, thank you. Uh, talking about the prosecution, seems like in some of the Muslim countries, especially Pakistan, we still see a lot of silent prosecution of Ismailis amongst the other Muslims living in this, this country. Can you shed a little bit light on this, please? Um, I think that uh, this type of thing will exist as long as there is lack of education and also as long as our Jamaat is not ready to explain who they are. See, that's why I feel knowledge is so important. It's a, it's a dual thing, right? First, the local population may not have the education with which to reason and understand. And secondly, the Jamaat itself also makes no efforts to explain themselves in a proper way, in a Quran-based way. You know, we cannot, for instance, if you uh, say to somebody uh, in Pakistan that our Ginan say this, or our Farman say this, they will not listen to you. But if you say to them, this is in the Holy Quran, they are bound to listen. So for that, we, the Jamaat, need knowledge. And uh, so what I, I, all I can say is that you know, there is a lot of hard work everywhere. We all have to do a lot of hard work. But we must be aware of the Imam's guidance. The Imam's guidance in recent years has been build bridges, but do not cross them. Build bridges with other communities. That requires knowledge. Without knowledge, you cannot build bridges. And so, building bridges is a way for a minority community like us. And then, of course, there is a whole aspect that, you know, many countries, in many countries, not just Pakistan, the Imam's presence through his institutions is so powerful that it is a natural protection for our Jamaat. That's all I would like to say. Uh, subhanallah, subhanallah. That, that is perfect. That's exactly the answer for us that we are looking for. The next question is for the history purposes only. And I understand it's not a ilmi question, but a, a history question. Do we know how many Smileys are in China? And are they safe from the uh, communist uh, country? Are they safe in the communist country? And how many Jamaat Khana did you say? There were. Okay, I didn't mention how many Jamaat there are. I only mentioned the first one uh, because it's a historic one and it was built by the uh, sacrifice of a Hunza Ismaili whose name is Allama Nasiruddin Nasir Hunzai and uh, it is his esoteric books which have taught us a lot about Ismaili Tarika. 
I didn't say how many. I don't know how many Jawan Khanas there are in China, okay? Uh, but as you all are aware, at this time, in the present uh, uh, communist regime of China, there is great persecution of all religions, but particularly of uh, the, uh, the Uyghur, the Uyghur Muslims who are in the western side of China, and our Ismailis who are known as Tajiks there, they are also in the western, uh, in the Xinjiang, Yarkand area. Uh, yes, there is persecution. Uh, uh, but our Jamal is very sensible, and I'm sure that uh, they are uh, protected by the Imam's life. Um, you know, Hazrat Imam has been to China twice. Once for an architectural seminar uh, in 1981, and there were three Ismailis who accompanied the 120 people that the Imam took there, and the three Ismailis were Rafi Keshaji, Muhammad Keshaji, and Dr. Hakeem Muhammad Munzai. And at that time, it was estimated that there was something like maybe 70 or the Ismailis there, but you know, there has been some emigration as well. Um, there you will find uh, the Ajik Ismailis from Xinjiang in parts of the world. There are uh, two at least that I know in London, for instance. Yeah? So we do not have any exact figures because, you know, we don't know if they have a uh, census records or anything like that. But I don't think that uh, I, can, I cannot uh, uh, tell you exact things, right? Because nobody knows this, right? Mm. Uh, there are two more questions. Uh, was Hajar or Hujjad, I believe, on the level of uh, Hajar, was on the level of Hujjad like Bibi Khatija? Did she also teach Hazrat Ismail? <laughs> she, uh, such a good question. Uh, Hajar was on the On the bottom says, uh, do we have any articles on Hazrat Hajra? No, I'm afraid I don't know of any. I don't know of any, which is why I'm appealing to the young scholars who are doing Islamic studies all over the world. Please, please turn your attention to all these type of topics which have not been researched at all. Okay. The next question is, can you put some light on the words of Ginan of Danak Kaling oh, Dan, oh, Dan Kaliga? Okay, G. Yeah, I can see half of it on my screen. Yes. Uh, okay. All right. Every culture and every philosophy has its own vocabulary, okay? Terminology. So this is from the Hindu. Uh, culture, 
if you look at uh, uh, Pinasi Kisra's Vajidim, uh, which inshallah, if you all pray, should uh, uh, see the light of day sometime soon. Uh, the word is Dajjal. Dajjal. And in English, the Dajjal will be called Antichrist. And uh, some people believe that this Dajjal of is in the world only once at the time of Kiyama. But according to Ismaili interpretation of particularly the Kiyamasek Israel tradition, Dajjal or then Kalinga or Antichrist is always present in the world. How? Because if you study the Quran, the Quran tells you that God has created everything in pairs. Only He is one. Everything else is in pairs. So since we have a Hadi Barak, a true Imam, a true guide, there must always be his opposite, the leader of the shaitan, the leader of the disbelievers, or unbelievers, or kafir, whatever you want to call them. And so they Kalinga, that Jal, Antichrist, one according to the Ismaili philosophy, is always present in the world because the Imam is always present in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, therefore, we need to follow the guidance of the Imam to be saved from his insinuations, the Dajjal or the Dain Kalinda's insinuations and the uh, Vasvasa. Yeah. Uh, next question is, yesterday you mentioned that uh, women were present in the masjid at the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At what time and how did women were, the word, I don't want to use the word, they were put out of the masjid? Yeah. I learned that in my Islamic course at McGill University. <laughs> And it was actually the worldly caliph number two, Hazrat Umma, who banished them from the masjid. Yeah. Oh, so it was very early on, okay? Yes, yes, uh, yes, very early on. He's the one who changed that, right? I see, okay. That, that was a really good question. I, I did not know answer to that either. So thank you for asking and thank you for replying. <laughs> Uh, I don't see any other question. Uh, Comrade Sahib, do we have any question that people wanted to ask and not write? Can we open the mic today? Yes, sir, we can do it. So I think there's one question in the chat. Uh, the friend is asking, can you share some of the tawil of the act of running back and forth between Safa and Marwa? Uh, for that, the best book is What You Did. Okay, I haven't uh, prepared uh, my lecture from the point of view of sharing that with. Uh, it was difficult enough for me to put the painful history in some sort of a sequence so that you would all be able to understand it well. Uh, I do not uh, have at the tips of my finger the tawil of that, but you will definitely find it in the book Wajidin, uh, the Urdu translation of which you will find at www ismaililiterature.org <coughs> Subhanallah, Subhanallah and uh, do we have any other question or is the mic open for whoever wants to ask a question? We can take another maybe seven minutes and then we can turn it off. Yali Madar Ali Madar Yali Madar Speaker Sahib I love the beautiful way you explained the history of the Ismaili struggle and persecution all in one session and it was a beautiful way how we have come along from the time of the Prophet up till today and out of 1400 years only a short period has been free without persecution and that is so much important to keep in mind that we must always be grateful for and I really appreciate the way you presented it. It all comes in a very, very beautiful way and I thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Shiraz, go ahead, please. 
Thank you, Rashid Sahiba. The uh, couple of uh, information requests. One is, uh, you mentioned importance of reading Quran. Do you recommend or can you recommend a Quran which is... But can you recommend a Quran? Okay. Okay, two, three points. First of all, there is no perfect translation of the Quran. It's uh, it's uh, Arabic is a very rich language, okay, and therefore nobody translates it correctly. Number two, every translator has a worldview, and his or her worldview is based on their beliefs, right? So if you have a Sunni translation, and in uh, Surah 17, Ayat 71. In Arabic, it, the word imam is singular, like the Yomana Dukulla Onasin bi Imamihim. 
a singular, it's not I Imma, it's uh, Imami him, but because it is a Sunni translator who believes in these four schools of jurisprudence and their leaders are called Imams, so he translates into English Imams or leaders, plural. So there is no perfect translation. Therefore, what we say to people is have you, if you can, have one Sunni translation, any of them, uh, but with a central column of the transliteration of the Arabic into the Roman character. So you can read the Arabic without knowing the Arabic. Hmm? And number two, you must have a Shia translation. And the Shia translation is also not perfect, because, you know, uh, a 12 Shia, uh, we'll always talk about 12 Imams. And uh, the one which is recommended is uh, Mir Ahmad Ali, which is uh, published in the United States. Uh, so Mir Ahmad Ali's Shia translation, particularly the big uh, volume, because it has lots of historical information, which is good. Very lengthy, but good. So we should have that, right? And uh, then there is uh, A.J. Arbery, who was a professor of Arabic at Cambridge or Oxford, and he's done an English translation, which, okay, he was only looking at the Arabic, but he doesn't get it right every time either. So you have to have more than one uh, translation. But my suggestion, my very humble suggestion is that I went to the Qur'an through Ismaili esoteric books. I didn't go to the Qur'an directly. This Qur'an is not a book that you read from page one to page whatever. You know, it is better to go through esoteric Ismaili books. And there are plenty of those. My husband and I have translated 70 of them, and they are all on the Ismaili literature website. Try to go to the Qur'an through those books, and then you will begin to see the light, literally. Subhanallah, Subhanallah, that was a perfect uh, suggestion, and uh, I hope people will pick up some of the uh, spiritual books written by our smileys and given the uh, Quranic references, and we can take those references and then go, jump into Quran and find the uh, good translation out of multiple Qurans. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think time is up, unless Kamri Sahib says it otherwise. I thank you so much for your time, and we are really, really looking forward to next Saturday session. I too, I am looking forward to the uh, next session uh, on the Israeli Center. It's one of my hobby horses. <laughs> so be ready to listen. <laughs> yes, yes, we are looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Is anyone else have any question? Otherwise, we're going to close this session. Uh, keep po uh, posting your phone number or whatever you need. And uh, inshallah, we will reply back to you. Thank you. Ya Ali Madad. Thank you, Rashida Saiba. Thank you, Yali Madad. Thank you, Yali Madad. This conference is no longer.